This is day four of the September 88 seven day retreat. There are still a couple of questions regarding what we've talked about, fear, and we will look at them together. One person said, It seems to me you're dealing too narrowly with this whole thing of fear, watching the thoughts, seeing the thoughts, and then in the seeing, no more fear. What I would say if someone came to me, telling me about waking up at night with night after night with panic, anxiety, thoughts triggering all of these states, I would ask, what, what is your diet? Do you get exercise? Do you get fresh air? Where do you work? Do you love your work? These are good points. And I think no matter what particular question we're dealing with, how does one live day in and day out in respect of those questions? How is one's diet? Does one pay any attention to it? not just read about it as a most confusing and ever more confusing amount of books about what one should eat, and they are so contradictory. <clears throat> and yet, one may have to start with some, something. More fresh food, more raw food, this or that, but then pay attention to how how does it agree with one? Does one feel energized? And is it just the kind of food one is eating? I think the, the best kind of food, if one overeats, one is going to feel bad afterwards. Dull, too stuck, or maybe even sick. So, and, and, and how is one eating? Is one gulping and wolfing it down? is when eating while reading, which is one of the strongest, the strongest habits we have. The, the morning paper comes for, as though it came for breakfast. There's a, a very cute little poem by a, a German poet who wrote these sarcastic poems. Morgenstern was his name. And he said, so-and-so invented a paper which, after you've read it, you're full, without eating anything. So anyone who is wise subscribes to that paper. You don't have to eat, you just read that. So, how, how is one eating? Is, is there some, some degree of awareness of the, the, the rate at which one is eating? Is, the chewing is not said moralistically or didactically, but just with interest. Because as there is more attention in eating and swallowing, and the, the rate may be slowing down, one may be a habitual 
gulper downer of food as there's a slower rate more space and more tasting of the food it may agree much more with one and one may not even need to eat as much not in order to reduce or not eat so much but when it doesn't want so much which later one regrets because it lies heavily in the stomach So often it is while the mouth wants to eat, the eyes also want to eat. Whatever's on the table, if nothing else is on the table, one reads the cereal box. And that's what the manufacturers want you to do. And as for fresh air, is there fresh air where one lives? Maybe not. So can one every once in a while during the week find a place where there are there is some greenery because green plants do do some purifying work of the air does one get exercise stretching stretching is, is a marvelous thing to do cats do it dogs do it with abandon they don't, they don't do yoga, they just stretch. And then we call a yoga exercise the cat and the dog. But do we do it with that same abandon? Not dutifully or because it's good for me, but it feels marvelous. And the, in doing it, can the, can the mind permeate and pervade the body? Meaning the awareness of this whole movement, not dutifully aware, but awareness of the everything stretching and the, the energy that circulates with that or is released with that. And walking, some, some strenuous walking every day is what was mentioned to me and ever since I've done it every day to bring the, the heart rate up until one is panting somewhat. It's, it's marvelous to do that, particularly when the air is fresh like here, to walk vigorously and breathe deeply. I've noticed that to the extent that the breathing during walking at least at times gets steep, if it's one deep, breathes deeply all the time and gets lightheaded. But for a while, with the deep breathing, I've noticed without putting any extra energy in it, the, the feet walk faster and f farther. There's some, some more energy from all this oxygen, probably. Don't have to explain it. It happens. And these lungs are fine uh, I don't have the, the word if we don't breathe deeply oh, a whole part of it never even gets used or uh, circulated with oxygen I just I was told once part of that sack hangs limp and isn't touched by the incoming oxygen if there isn't some deep breathing and yet, the lungs are made for that, exists for that, and there may be some atrophy if there's no deep breathing. Sleep, does one get rest? The rest that the, the body and nervous system need and demand. It's different for different times of the year and for different people for different occasions, but is one, is one sensitive? Sensitive to the uh, basic needs of this organism, which is a marvelously sensitive instrument, which needs sensitive care to function well, healthily, Sanely.
so as one watches the input of the of the food, can one also watch the mental input? The rate of input is the, the entertainment right now is virtually unlimited. Right in one's own room, house. I visited for a week with our children. There are three TVs in that house. Family room, main room, and in the bedroom. <clears throat> And now with the, with the video, there is an almost limitless supply for our limitless demands for entertainment. Now this is not knocking, watching a movie or listening to music, or, but is there some sensitivity to when it's enough? just as there is sensitivity possible when, it, when one has eaten enough. And is there some quiet time in, in one's life? Really, in one's daily life, some quiet time? Or is it going going, going, with noise, talking, listening, the media, reading, and all the other sounds around us from morning till night, and then all the sounds of the dreams. Does one have some quiet time? Allow for it. Often people tell me, when, when I get home from retreat for a while, I have some quiet time, but then sort of there's so much to do. Get overwhelmed, or I just simply forget about it. Don't think about it anymore. And when I come back, I think, my God, how could I have forgotten that? The marvel of quietness. Not inducing a state, but just sitting down quietly with a chair, sofa, floor, whatever feels right at the moment. Walking quietly, but walking quietly is not quite the same as some time of not moving, motionlessness. stop and listen to whatever is going on inside and out. Without any choice or preference or judgment. Or escape for that matter. We're not saying if you do this A, B, C, D, E, F, then you won't have fear. It's nonsense. But maybe it's a, it's a different way of meeting the fear. And if the, the physical organism is exhausted from abuse, exhausted from the lack of proper care. Does one have a tree to look at? sometime to, to be close to, does, can one see the sky, 
look at it sometime during the day. It's getting harder and harder when there's a city worker. The offices often don't have windows. Windows have to be closed because of the air conditioning. And yet there's some time when, you, when one leaves the office. Maybe just to walk to the car. On that short walk, can one look up at the sky? Maybe if one is lucky, the car is parked under a tree. <laughs> neatly put into the cement. Can one look at it? At the leaves, the bark, and the tree against the sky, right now still green in a few weeks, all the colors, and then the tree without leaves. Just the branches all ready with little buds for the next year. And if it has rain, it's a, it's a marvelous sight. The, the glistening branches get dark earlier. The street lights may be on and there. Are these glistening branches and buds in the trunk. Doing it for no one. It's just there. There to be looked at. And and enjoy it. Another question in connection with fear came up actually in the first meeting with someone who told me in watching fear what reveals itself as that fear almost always comes out of wanting. One can look at that oneself. Wanting. Wanting to be liked and, the, and hand in hand with it. Or the other side of that wanting to be liked is the fear I won't be liked. Maybe right now I'm liked, but the next moment I have to check again. Does he or she still like me? Still smiling? Oh, so the, the wanting goes with the fearing. Wanting to be successful and fearing to be a failure. Wanting a a loving relationship and afraid one will lose that person or one will be lonely for the rest of one's life. And the other side of wanting is not wanting something, not wanting to be with this person or not wanting to have this pain and fearing one is stuck with it. Fearing one will not be able to get rid of who one has to work with, live with, or the pain, anxiety, or whatever. So one can observe this, that fearing and wanting go together. And the vehicle for both wanting and fearing is thought. Thought and remembrance, memory. Without memory and thought, you can't imagine wanting something. I have to imagine something and then imagine myself having that and then wanting that. Then the whole machinery mechanism of wanting and desire setting into motion. Seeing something, imagining myself having that or being with that person and wanting that, desiring it, craving it. 
likewise we've talked for two days about the involvement of thought in fearing. Imagining catastrophe or loss or ending and of course imagining oneself in that catastrophe or with that loss or ending and then the process of fear or anxiety spilling all over the body. So thought and image are the vehicle for both wanting and fearing. Don't take my word for it, but you can find it out and see it for yourself. You don't need to believe this. Accept it or reject it, but, but test it out, verify it. In one's moment-to-moment -moment living, and with this, a, there is a deepening of this living. Because there is awareness and insight, discovery. And in a true discovery, there is the possibility for change. So in talking again later on about this fearing and wanting, and then wondering, well, what is... Oh, so, all right, so it comes from thought and memory, but where does that come from? Does that have a source? Because one can... Now, we can think it through. So memory comes from past experiences, which the brain, it has the capacity to store memory, registers. <coughs> brain being a storehouse of individual, collective, racial, animal memory. Since time immemorial has, has there been this collection of memory in the brain. But where does the brain and all of that development come from? Where does life come from? Life on Earth. We don't know if there's life on other planets, but on other planets, on other solar systems. But why not? But if so, where does it come from? That question is our conditioning, isn't it? To want to know where something comes from. Someone else asked this, this passion of, of looking and uh, investigating or attending, questioning, where does that come from? Where does everything come from? The whole universe. You could say, well, the latest theory is the Big Bang, but where did that come from? Was there something before that? And before that, and before that? You know, there's no end to thinking. Thinking can go on and on, but can it touch the source of everything? It can imagine a source and believe that the imagined source is the real thing. A God, or the primeval darkness, or the void. Or all, all manner of things have been invented, conceptualized as the source of everything. But can one see that that is still thought and concept and symbol. And can one see the limitation of thought bound to concepts and symbols and images? It can't go beyond that. Thought can't go beyond itself. Because as long as it's operating its thought and creating concepts and symbols, believing them maybe to be real, but that's illusion. It's thought. So is there something other than thought? Is there a source? 
from which everything comes? We don't know, do we? We can't know it. It can't be known. It can't be a matter of knowledge. Because knowledge is forever limited by thought. When the, the thinking machine realizes that, can it abstain to try to enter into what it cannot enter into? And be quiet, quietly listening, not knowing, Listening without knowing. Realizing very clearly that the word is not the reality. The word silence is not the actuality of silence. What is the actuality of it? The word has to be put aside or be quiet, doesn't it? The, the word faint sounds can be heard, cicadas, faint traffic. These words are not the sounds, are they? Listen. The word airplane is a word, but that's not what's going on. So one has to listen without the word to be in touch with what's actually going on. That's simple, isn't it? It may not be easy, but it's simple. <laughs> Every once in a while, people will come in meeting and say, I really don't know what, how to do this work you're talking about. I feel stuck. I don't know how to go about it. And then the way we start is simply by listening. It's not so complicated as thought makes it. Thought that wants something, wants a method, a procedure, and a goal, and so forth, and progress. That's all complicated thought stuff. We're inundated from it since pre-nursery pre school. Can one begin to simply listen to what's there? The, the breathing is going on whether one is listening to it or not. A first certain physical feeling of the knees and the sits bones and the cushion. There may be a tension in the neck and shoulders. There's a heartbeat. Here and there there's a bumping of an insect against the glass. See, I'm, I'm labeling right now, but can we listen without labeling? Or at least realizing the label is not this boom, boom, or the You could say, well, you say the same thing over and over again. I do, but do the same thing, not the same thing. But this is what's actually happening. 
we're listening to something that's actually going on. And no denying it. And there's no need to be bored with it. We're only bored when we're not listening, when we think something more exciting ought to be happening. Then there comes a feeling of discontent and boredom. But in, in simple listening, without wanting anything else to happen. There's the wholeness of life. Which includes an angry thought coming up and the, the response of anger throughout the system or fear. To listen to that, like to the buzzing at the window. Not give explanations and, and, and causes and descriptions. Or if that's what the brain is doing, to be aware that that's what it is doing and that is preventing the immediacy of listening. One person said, even if it's relatively quiet, thought is quiet, the brain isn't too active, there's still this feeling that there's someone there. Me. way of getting away from this feeling. It, it's so deep, it's so grounded in, in my whole being that there is me here. Shall we look at that? What that is? Can it reveal itself? This deeply grounded, convincing sense of meanness Are we talking about the sensations that emanate from the body? We mentioned them earlier, at the knees, thighs, and uh, all over the breathing. Heartbeat, and certain tensions, or a feeling of well-being, energy, or feeling of lack of energy, maybe a pain in the back or somewhere. Is that what one is talking about? Or what one refers to when one says there is a sense of me being here? We, we described all of that and sensed it at the same time without the need of feeling this is me. To say this is me is extra. And if that expression is used to communicate, wait a minute, you're stepping on my toe, uh, to, to refer to something concrete, I think it's indicated to say that. A person may not realize that. The person who's stepping, I think, may think he's stepping on a root out in the woods and is on my toe. <laughs> Or if 
we, we want to get letters, we have to give our address, our name. Parents having more than one child, even one child, to call the child, the child has to have a name. Two, I have to know which one is to answer. There's, there's some practicality in names. And referring to this particular organism as differentiate from this or this or that one. But we're talking about the psychological feeling of I'm here, me. Which we're examining, what that is. What it is made up of, what the ingredients of it are. And we're wondering whether or not all of the ingredients of that feeling of me again come from past experiences, memories, thoughts, pictures, and the emotional attachment to all of that. Not just happy attachment, but fearful attachment to it. The fear, I may not be anything. Hearing talks or having read maybe Buddhist literature or Hindu literature. The fear, I may not be anything, and then holding on to this with a resistance or a fearful attachment to this idea of me that I need it, that without that I will sort of dissolve in the void, which is an idea. We're just looking at what, what makes for that feeling of there's me here. As one person said, I definitely have the feeling it's not just this here, the thigh, but it's my thigh. Well, well, clearly this is here and that one is there and that is not mine, if you want to put it this way. But there's much more to the psychological feeling of this is mine. Is, whatever it is, it is connected with thinking about oneself. Since the day thinking started, and having images about oneself, which are treasured as our most precious possession, and therefore feared for or protected and the drive to enhance these images, embellish them, aggrandize them, maybe make them known to others, like one likes to show an art show to people to show what one owns, identified with what one owns in pictures. One is those pictures. And that's sort of the internal art show internal pictures that one prizes, protects, ensures. And that one does protect them is found out when they are attacked and then the defensiveness and hurt. We've talked about this in great detail at other times. And Interestingly enough, it doesn't matter whether the pictures are positive ones or negative ones. There's equal attachment to them. And equal vulnerability about them being hurt or losing them, they being damaged. Not acknowledged shaded by someone else's pictures. The reason it is mentioned time and time again is that this is the raw material, 
that makes our prison. A prison in which we feel at times, or most of the time. But no amount of talking about it can reveal it directly. It has to be seen. Maybe at, at a moment of hurt or flattery. That it is just a picture that is smarting or expanding. And that what one is attached to is the energy that comes from that flattery. And what one hates is the, the pain that comes from the hurt or the deflation. So that what is often brought up by people is, I used to have such negative images of myself when I was younger, child in school and so forth, and I worked very hard to overcome those or replace those with positive images. And now I don't see any sense of letting go of them. It was hard work to get this, and I feel better now about myself. Which may be entirely true. We're not questioning the truth of feeling better. What we're asking is, does one need any images of oneself at all? Even though the image-making process is constantly going. But can one become aware of that and question the need for it? And observe in one's daily relationship the the agony that the image creates, the conflicts. We have conflicting images of ourselves. The fear of exposure, how somebody will think or see me, think of me or see me. Not to do anything with force or out of a new idea, I shouldn't have any images, but just observe, look, see, discover, find out as we go, learn as we go. And one, one may find that talking about it time and time again, discussing it in meetings or talking about it in talks or discussion periods, is not unrelated to a sudden insight, yes, this is indeed so. Because if, we, if the mind does not occupy itself with this at all, it functions automatically in imagery, which creates our endless wantings and fearings, cravings and, and terror. So there. If there is any magic at all, it is the magic of understanding how this mind and body function. If it is clearly understood and seen as it functions, it, fun it begins to function differently. Without any intention to change or overcome or repress or Because with the, with the clarity and honesty and freedom of observation also comes a new intelligence. Wisdom, if you like the word better. It doesn't matter. The word is not the actuality of it. It begins to sprout with this moment-to-moment -moment observing honestly and, f and, and fearlessly. Because, wait, wait a minute, how can you observe fear fearlessly? I think you can. Meaning, not escaping, but complete exposure of this state as it is evolving or unfolding.
as it is unfolding, not reflecting upon it afterwards, although that's, that's what it is, but that's not the, the birth of intelligence, of an intelligence that is, has nothing to do with thinking or intellect, it has to do with seeing what is. And as we mentioned in other talks, not just intelligence alone, but something else which we call by the name of compassion and, and love. which is also not sub something subject to knowledge or thought. It defies thinking about it or knowing it. It's, it's either there and, and operating freely or it isn't. Which reminds me of a question which has come up and often comes up. Someone asking, how can I love others if I, can, if I don't love myself? Don't I have to start with loving myself? How is one to love oneself? This is another command given, another of the many commands that we give ourselves all the time. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Now love yourself. How am I to love myself if I hate myself? Can one be with what's there. If there's hatred, self-hatred, can it be allowed to be looked at? As it is, meaning all the thoughts, imagery, to, to see it, moments at a time, one will notice how one doesn't want to look. One rather likes to think about the possibility of loving oneself, but that's not looking at self-hatred. And it's only out of seeing what is and not dividing or conflicting with it. That there may be a change and the, the emergence of love. And that's not for self or other. Love isn't like that. It's love. It's there when we're not caught up and imprisoned in all of these ideas about myself and the commands to myself. When that's all quiet because it's understood as it happens. So, wherever one finds oneself confused or blocked or stymied, you can stop simply now by listening freshly to what's there. Confusion or feeling of blockedness. Listen to it. Not condemn it or throw one's hands up about it. But with, a, with, a, with an interest, what, what is blockage or confusion? Not I, ought, I shouldn't be confused on the fifth day or so. That adds to the confusion. That is the confusion. I shouldn't, I should be clear, but I'm confused. So I'm confused. To, to, to listen to it. Listen to all these conflicting shoulds and oughts. 
and not meddle with it. Inside doesn't meddle, it just sheds light, that's all. We will end here for today.